Hi, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Dunker Spot. We are part of 342 Productions. I am your host, Nikaias Duncan, and joining me as always is my co-host, Steve Jones Jr. Steve, how are you doing, sir? Ah, feeling good, feeling great. Happy to be here, excited to be here. Thank you, Dunkers, for once again embracing your bounce. Uh, Dunker Nation, let's ride. Nikaias! Uh, you can see I'm nice and warm, ready to go. No frozen duties over here. Uh, <laughs> it is time to hoop it up. It is indeed time to hoop it up. Uh, before we hoop it up, we're going to bounce around the league again. We got some fun teams to talk about, some questions to toss out, all that good stuff. I just want to take a very brief, like, 15 seconds to salute Jason Kelsey uh, for retiring as an Eagles fan on the podcast. Future Hall of Famer, Super Bowl winner, incredible dude, incredible locker room guy. The uh, the co-author of the Twitch push, I, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, watching the presser before the pod, and that man started crying immediately. I was like, oh, no, I am going to be in shambles. Trying to talk about basketball after that, but salute to a tremendous career there. Philly's got some work to do, but we got a whole lot of cap space, so we'll see what happens there. Uh, just want to throw in some football first um, before we get to some basketball, but there you go. Uh, but it is indeed time to hoop it up, unless you, you got any jokes for me, uh, any anything I should be aware of before we jump into the basketball? Uh, No. I would not do that to you. Uh, salute uh, to the legendary Jason Kelsey. Okay. Well, there we go. All right. Well, let's bounce around. Steve, who are some teams that have caught your eye as of late? But we're going, we're, start, we're starting it. in one place, buddy. There's only okay. one place only. Now, if you're a long term dumper, and also, hi, YouTube, hi. Uh, we want to thank you for all your contributions and your support. And you should hit the uh, like button, subscribe, comment. Uh, tell us your biggest surprise this season. Maybe we'll talk about it next week. Nikaias. What's up? There's something in the air. Every time you start to see tax commercials, seems to be the same time that Nikaias Duncan turns around on the Miami Heat. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to start there. I want to start with your thoughts on the Miami Heat, who, as I try to tell people, would be fine, seem to be fine. <laughs> what do you think, bud? Actually, uh, they are. <laughs> Before we get to the heat. Okay. I apologize for the mess. We need to acknowledge the Boston Celtics. And just a quick segment I call a hat tip to the Boston Celtics because, buddy, what are they doing? <laughs> Dominating is what they're doing. Nikaias, do you know that they have shot 50% or better in 10 straight games? That seems very difficult to do. The record for the Celtics is 14, but the, the, they've been on fire. Did you know the Celtics are 10-0 and 0 when they've made 20 or more threes? That seems impressive and also difficult to do. The fact that they've done that 10 times is probably stands out more than the record. Did you know that the Celtics are 33-6 and 6 when they have 25 or more assists this year? That is uh, pretty impressive. And then and I, for reasons, I did know that. <laughs> and I went down another <laughs> rabbit hole. So Jalen Brown, very impressive game against Golden State. Uh, hit a lot of threes, made them pay. Do you know the Celtics are 17-1 and one when Jalen Brown scores 10 or more points and has five or more assists? Hmm. That's a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. You see, you see why I was... Uh, the shot making and the assist 5-4. I, I, I like that one. I like that one. Yeah. I just wanted to salute to them. that They haven't lost since, what, February 1st? So we figured like a good time to go ahead and give them a, another tip of the cap before we dive in some of these other teams. It, they're figuring it out on both ends of the floor. Uh, offensively, the movement's been tough. The defense has been great. I, I believe you have a really fun stat for the Celtics as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm pulling it back up. Steve, they have a 138 offensive rating since the All-Star break. <laughs> 138. That's not how that's supposed to work. Like, that is that is maybe a, a good day in the wreck on 2K when you're facing a team that should not be on the court with you. That is not a National Basketball Association team in which they have played other teams that are supposed to contend this year or make noise in the playoffs this year. Like, we've been, like, we've touched it on the pod, but, like, overall basketball discourse, like, we've been kind of eyeing what the Warriors have been able to do since Draymond Green's been back and how well they've been playing. Boston was up 44 to 22 after the first quarter. It was 82-38 at the half. 
I would love to talk about the the spacing and the the Derek White, Christoph Porzingis pick and roll and the Jason Tatum drives and Jason Tatum in the mid post and how they have the wings clear for him. He can go to either direction, how much better he's been at making decisions from that spot, all that good stuff. At a certain point, you just start laughing at what the Boston Celtics are doing. That they're marrying this kind of shot making and spacing, lowest of keys, as you know, I've I've been the rim pressure guy throughout the history of this podcast. Lost the keys, top 10 in rim rate post All-Star break. That seems important. That you're getting this kind of three-point shooting. You're also touching the paint to this degree, getting this amount of paint points. And the defense remains elite throughout all of this. And we just talked, what, last week? <laughs> About all the different things that they can do matchup-wise and scheme-wise. So check out the episode last week if you want a deeper dive on that front. But they're doing that stuff too. And so, like, there is going to be some sort of regression in terms of the three-point shooting, which, very quickly on that front, post-All-Star break, the Boston Celtics, 77% at the rim, 47% on mid-range shots, 48% from three, 50% on corner three since the All-Star break. They have an effective field goal percentage of 67.5. That is dumb. (laughs) complimentary but that is dumb <laughs> the level of shot making we have seen from boston and like that isn't gonna hold up there will be a dip but as long as they continue to make quick decisions as long as they continue to touch the paint to this degree like this is all you kind of need to see from boston i think we've all kind of zoomed out with their roster and say if they're healthy like this is the most talented roster in the east if not the league itself and if they're able to play up to their level like they should come at the east at minimum Obviously, playoffs are a whole different deal. Matchup's going to be important. We'll see what happens there. But just in terms of the process, I love that I haven't been able to complain too much about what was this shot, why are they taking so long. Like, those obsessions are sprinkled in, but it's not as prevalent to the point to where, hey, let's have a segment about the Boston offense and see what's going on here. The fact that it hasn't been that is very encouraging to me. Very good. And so I just want, I wanted to make sure we we gave them their shout uh, because as you mentioned, they've built this the right way. They've answered and checked almost everything off the box as of right now. Uh, there are some things that we'll, I'm sure we'll dive into as we get closer to the playoffs, but the Celtics, they are moving in the right direction. But back to you. You're not off the hook, buddy. The Heat. <laughs> Where are you at with the Heat, man? Uh, I'm feeling better about the Heat than the last time I brought them up on the podcast in which it was like, hey, man, I don't know what's going on with this offense. Bam's having to do a lot. And if now the midi isn't falling anymore, what's up with the Tyler Hero fit? What's going on with the shooting? Defensively, why can't anybody keep the ball in front? This does not look like a Heat team. And you expertly said, hey, these reps are going to end up being important. Eric Spolster isn't sweating any of this. They're ultimately going to be fine. And if I remember correctly, like I, I noted, like they should play better. But I can, you know, I can only go off of what I'm seeing right now. And it's like, hey, they may very well turn around. They do this every year. But right now, this doesn't look good. And I'm just noting that it doesn't look good. They look a lot better post-All-Star break. And, like, as far as the actual star power, Bam is back to knocking down jumpers. The face-up game has been incredibly effective for him. He's been able to get downhill going either direction. Sprinkling in those fading jumpers, been able to turn baseline and get some finishes at the rim, get to the free throw line. Not as much as we're accustomed to, but still can get to the line in a timely spot. Jimmy Butler has hit the on button post All-Star break. Was averaging around 20 drives per 100 possessions before the All-Star break. That's up to 23 now. He's shooting 60% from three post All-Star break. That number obviously isn't going to stand, but you zoom out for the rest of the year. Like he's been above 40% all year long. Smallish volume. But it's always funny to me when he's just spaced on the weak side, the ball swings, he has the time to check his phone, do his taxes, very grounded jumper, but just going in with consistency. And teams are like slowly but surely creeping out a little bit more when he's just standing there alone. It's still not a hard closeout, so I'm not going to sell that. But at least teams are more cognizant, hey, he can do this if we give him time. Let's at least make him think about a closeout. And so going to continue to monitor that portion, but it's really the drives for me and the defensive intensity for Jimmy Butler has picked back up. And he's back to these Ed Reed like pick sixes. He's back to being nasty when he's stationed at the nail. You can't just throw blind passes around him anymore. And so, like watching his overall effort on both ends perk up, I think has led the charge for this heat, uh, this heat surge as of late. So I've really enjoyed what Jimmy and Bam been able to do. 
Duncan Robinson in the starting lineup continues to lead to wins. But beyond that, I just love the way that he slots into the offense. Off the ball, he unlocks just about everything Miami wants to do, whether it's just a simple wide pin down or anything more exotic. His movement is very important for the offense. The two-man pairing with Bam out of bio. They can play pitch and catch, keep cut all over the place. When they th- toss it into Bam, they're going to get into their post splits. You never know which way he's going. He's also a very willing and physical screener, so he prides other guys open. And if you botch a switch, now he's flying up above the break, receiving a handoff, and now he can fire into a shot or pass it back to Bam or turn back the other way. That turns into a rescreen, a natural pick and roll. He gets downhill. The drives have been very impressive for Duncan Robinson. This is something that we talked about earlier in the year. But that continues to be um, – he, he continues to provide a positive impact there. And so, like, watching them kind of figure things out offensively, and something I noted not too long ago was that the actual spacing for Miami has felt better. So this is a team that is very willing to cut, but there have been instances early in the year where they're cutting on top of each other. They're cutting as Bam's trying to make a move to the basket. They're cutting as Jimmy Butler's trying to make a move to the basket. It seems like as the team has gotten, they still aren't completely healthy. But as they're starting to at least get more time with each other, they're starting to get the timing down on stuff like that. And now you're starting to see like some of the high post passing from Bam Pop even more because he knows when the cuts are going. And those guys know when to get to the basket. And so the process just feels a lot cleaner offensively. And defensively, again, better effort from Jimmy Butler. Bam Adebayo has been very good in the drop. Also can switch when necessary. You know how tough it is to get past him when he does switch out into the perimeter. Keeping eyes on Terry Rozier, the effort has been good at the point of attack. Like I still you know, wouldn't call him an elite defender or anything of that sort. But like that ball pressure at least has been important. Caleb Martin's looking more like himself defensively and having the option to toss him on smaller guards and turn some of those pick and rolls into switches I think has been important. Miami has continued to tinker with the zone this year, in this calendar year to be more specific, um, leading the NBA in zone possessions in 2024. And so continuing to monitoring how much they mix that stuff in. Um, I've really enjoyed the second unit, Jaime Jaquez, as he's getting further away from the injury. He's looking more like himself, um, connecting things in the half court. The post-ups against smaller defenders have been good. Defensively, keeping an eye on what he does in space, but at least knows where to be. Kevin Love continued to provide positive impact off that Miami bench. Hey, man. I, shout out to Kevin Love. Shooting 38.5% from three post-All-Star break. But being able to space to that degree, the quick outlets helping juice Miami's transition attack as this isn't the most athletic roster in the league. But him grabbing the board and fling get 45, 50 feet gets Miami into the other side of the court very quickly. And he's held serve defensively. If he has to be at the level, he'll do that. If he's up to touch and drop it back, he'll do that. If he's at the bottom of the zone, he'll do that. And as long as they're not getting blitzed in his minutes defensively, the offensive impact is easy to see. Just by virtue of him standing above the break, Miami has more room to do things inside the arc. So this is more in tune for what this Miami Heat team can be. There are still questions to answer just in terms of the rotation. Like, I enjoyed the DeLon Wright debut. In some of the minutes, and we just haven't really seen him on the last two games. As Terry Rozier's got back into the lineup, Tyler Hero's going to be back soon, so I imagine that's also going to cut to some of the uh, the guard minutes, and there's going to be some reconfiguring there. Who's going to start? What is the rotation going to look like? What are the closing lineups going to look like? So there are still things for Miami to answer, but this is a good team. And quiet is kept. They are not that far out of a home court seed <laughs> in the East right now. And so I've just been impressed with them looking more like what I thought they would look like. And and there it is. How did I do? There it is, folks. You see why I swung the ball. I I, I, I knew he had some of that in them. I knew it was coming. I knew it was going to happen. And you know Miami's playing well, not just because they've won 10 of their last 13, but Nikias gave Kevin Love some actual love. (laughs) That's great. Uh, it's, it's, uh, It's insanity. I think the most important thing is a game and a half out of four. Obviously, Knicks, Sixers trying to figure out how to navigate these injuries. We've talked about that. But that feels like a key portion for a Miami team who had battled to get to that position and worked through some things and now are are looking like they might be able to get back to it. The thing about the Heat for me, outside of Coach Bo, outside of Heat culture, outside of Jimmy, the continued growth of Bam, they take their lumps in the regular season. It's hard to toe that line, but they are going to take their lumps. Those stretches where the ball is stagnant or the movement's inconsistent, the defense is struggling to keep the ball in front, the rotations and activity isn't as crisp. 
they keep working to progress towards where they know that specific group needs to get to to have maximum success. And while this may not be the ultimate payoff, you can continue to see them move in the right direction. You know, you, you watch and you see how they are able to open movement up to get Bam in the post. You see how he's able to be aggressive and attack. And now you see more and more teams deciding to react and show help or show doubles. And now Miami's evolving and to be able to make you pay with that. I think that's a plus. I think being able to run the occasional Jimmy and Bam pick and roll or handoff in scenarios where teams don't want to switch and that opening things up, that's a plus. You mentioned the Duncan Bam two-man game and how they open things up. For me, it's just about that ball movement for them offensively. You're seeing it move a little bit more. You're seeing it pop a little bit more when they create an advantage. That's always kind of the yin-yang for Miami. It's been a plus of recent, uh, recently. Uh, two of their last three games, Nikias, against Utah, 46 made field goals, 33 assists. At Portland, 37 made field goals, 29 assists. It's not an exact science, Nikias. But for me, that's a pretty good barometer on if they are playing heat basketball positive mm-hmm. uh, version. And that took me down a little bit more of a, uh, a rabbit hole. They are 24 and 7 this year when they have 26 or more assists. And then are you ready for another one? What you got? As you mentioned the playmaking of Duncan Robinson. The Heat are 10 and 1 right now when Duncan Robinson has five or more assists. Hmm. Hey, Steve, guess how many assists Duncan Robinson's averaging post All Star break? How many? Five. Boom. See? Look yeah. at that. High five. <laughs> but you're seeing that activity perk up defensively. I, I want to give a salute to Jovic for the work that he's put in. But they're, yes. they're, they're starting to fly around more. You can start to see a little bit more activity. And it's one thing that you mentioned the zones. One thing that Cooper Moorhead has made a great point for about like a month or so is when Spo decides to deploy it. And if he goes to the press into the zone in the fourth quarter so teams can't adjust as easily. This is a team that would probably tap the zone button even more and probably have three to four more wins, but that's not real. Ties back to the lump. So I think the Heat are continuing to answer the questions they need to and work themselves in a position to have that success in the postseason. Good stuff. Can I ask you a question uh, about the Heat? Um, How do you feel about the four room right now? Between Caleb Barton, Haywood Highspill, if you just mentioned Jovic, which I should have gave him a quick shout out because that man has been working defensively. It hasn't been perfect. But Miami has asked him to defend a lot of different types of players. Like going back to the Pelicans game, they ended into shenanigans. He's had some possessions against Zion. He had some possessions against JV. Asked him to switch sometimes. He had to funnel the ball and keep things in front. He's working and offensively shooting well from three. You can see some of the passing flashes when he has it. But just I guess where are you at with that, with the state of that particular room? Because that was a question that I had entering the year and we talked about that in the season preview. Like, do you feel more comfortable about that slot? I probably feel about the same, uh, slightly better, mainly because everyone's gotten reps and everyone should be have a higher level of comfort with what they need to do in that specific role in that task. I think the tricky part is the amount of banged upness they've had makes it to where it's a little mix and matchy for me to where they have more optionality. But at the same time, I don't know what the go-to would be to a degree. Yeah. Like I have it in my mind of what they would be, but I'm not sure, you know, it, but the fact that, you know, if Martin all of a sudden becomes back to form, I think that answers a lot of question. I think you probably feel good about Highsmith's defense, uh, depending on who they're playing with. I mean, the answer could just be Jimmy and or Jaime. So I think it's, mm-hmm. I think they have probably more answers than they did at the beginning of the season. So that's probably the plus. Yeah. That's I'm glad you said it because like that's kind of where I land. Like I feel better about it, but I still don't feel like my question has been answered about okay, who is the four? Because I think you can make arguments for all of those guys like starting a particular game. If the Heat are playing, I guess not now since Trey Young's out, but like historically, if the Heat are playing the Atlanta Hawks, we want Caleb Martin in. Like you're gonna start at the four, but you're guarding Trey because we trust you against smaller guards in general. With Haywood Highsmith, like we trust you, even though he's only like six four, but like we trust you against like the bigger wing types than we do like a Caleb or someone like that. Jaime, as we've talked about throughout the year, how impressive his rookie year has been. Very quick processor. If we need a secondary scoring option, either as you know alongside one of the stars with a bench unit, or if you want to play him with Jimmy and Bam, like we trust you to do that. Yovic can fill gaps, and I'm glad that he's getting these reps. Like I don't know if he has hit the threshold enough to where he's going to factor into Miami's playoff rotation if the team is reasonably healthy. 
But, like, it's been good for him to get these reps on both ends. And so, like, I think it is a positive that on any given night as the regular season goes on, they can go to either of those four guys and have sound reasoning behind it, and you can feel pretty good about it. But, like, I still don't know day one of the playoffs, this is going to be the guy. Like, I feel like if we do a series preview, you know, in the postseason, like, the X factor is just going to be the four position for Miami. And I would at least want to get to the point to where it is Caleb Martin because I've decided he is D4 and he's going to be, he's going to need to pop versus whoever can pop from that group. If that makes sense. It does. It does. Can I make a terrible sports analogy? Sure. Is it just a bullpen by committee? Hmm. The heat bullpen. I see. I see. I can, I I can pick up what you're putting now. We'll, we'll, We'll rock with it. We'll rock with it. Um, any closing heat thoughts? No, before no, no. I, I am curious to see what happens with the schedule here. Uh, mm-hmm. You face a, a tricky Detroit team, and then you go at Dallas, at Oklahoma City. That's a back-to-back. Ew. So uh, then you have the Wizards, and then you have Denver. So it could, it could get interesting. Ah, and so... We're going to do the Dunker Spot special in which we give the Heat the praise and then we, you know, we zoom out a week and a half and the Heat have lost like three of their last four or something. <laughs> and now they're in eight. It's like, well, glad we talked about it when we did. It's like when I brought up the Hornets defense and uh, they have now slipped to, I think, like like 13th or something like that post All-Star right now. It's like, well, glad I got that in before. <laughs> they scored like 25 against Milwaukee in the first half or whatever that number was. Anyway, let's get into some teams that we are thinking about. I would like to start with the West leading Oklahoma City Thunder, mm. who I have thoroughly enjoyed over the last few seasons, but particularly this one, in which, again, they are now at the top of the West. They are one of two teams in the league per cleaning the glass that's in the top five in offense and defense. They are the third best offense in the league, fifth best defense. Naturally, the Boston Celtics are the other one. They are first in offense. They now currently hold the best offensive rating in NBA history, by the way, Steve. Um, Boston's first in offense. They are third in defense. This team is so freaking good. And like, on one hand, I'm just like, is, is it time to just go all the way in on OKC? Like, I, I think if I had to pick today, like, I think Denver comes out of the West, but I don't think they're that far behind Denver in playoff equity. And I recognize that this particular group hasn't had, like, a bunch of playoff runs together. And so, like, to that point, there's some playoff inexperience, but, like, you know, play, Shea's been in playoff games. Like they have guys on the roster that have at least been in the postseason, so they're not completely new to it. But I just look at what they're able to do offensively, what Shea's been able to do. We know how good he is as a driver. The playmaking can continue to improve. The post game, the isolations, the pull ups inside the arc, and more recently, or at least calendar year twenty twenty four, the pull ups beyond the arc now, like soft switches or soft slash indecisive switches or unders are now being punished by pull-up threes from Shea. And that is a terrifying thought if you're trying to project towards, okay, what can we do in a playoff setting to really bother him? We know we want to crowd him. Let's get some length on him, et cetera. We're going to duck under these high pick and rolls. Let's dare him to shoot. If he's already starting to do that with confidence, it's not that it can't work in a postseason setting, but at the very least, it's not something that's going to fluster him it just becomes more of a results-based deal versus something that can just distort OKC's offense. And for a team that already drives more than anyone else and cuts all over the place and does a very good job of the spacing and mixing up their spacing, sprinkling in guards in the dunker spot, inverting the offense, having Chet as a a spacer at at the wing so bigs can't be in the paint. Like, they already pose so many problems. And so, like, on one hand, I'm thinking about OKC, like, I was high on them. Should I be even higher on them? based on what they've shown so far. And on the other hand, if we're doing like the hand things, like one hand here, the other hand's here. On the lower hand, I just have like some rotation questions for them. Like I'm not even going to press the rebounding button. Like Mark Dacknote just had a really good quote about, yeah, we're, we're just going to get out rebounded sometimes. But until that trade-off isn't worth it, we're just going to live with that. Like we can't be a perfect team. We can't, we're going to end up chasing our shadow, um, trying to solve literally every problem that we have paraphrasing there he's like no we, we're this good because of this and if we have to lose these battles to be this good we'll just take that but like i look at the wing room in particular like i think the loudest thing you can point to with okc is like a potential weak point to playoff series this is josh giddy offensively teams are more like more often putting centers on him and just say do whatever you want out there 
So there's that portion. To OKC's credit, they do have a lot of different options. They don't mind closing games with Isaiah Joe. They don't mind closing games with Aaron Wiggins. I think a big reason why they acquired Gordon Hayward is because he should project to be a guy that can fill that closing spot if necessary. And so they have options. So I'm not worried in that regard. I'm more so like wondering at what point is the plug fully pulled on the Giddy thing? Is that just something that just happens in the playoff game? And he just gets the rest of the regular season for rope? Because like the men is already down. And then connected to that, honestly just want to get your thoughts on the Gordon Hayward experience so far. Because to this point, he has not taken a three in OKC. He hasn't logged a lot of drives. He's done some really good stuff as a cutter. So like he is generating rim pressure in that way. But like it, he's blended in a lot more than I anticipated. And that's more on the derogatory side. Like take a little bit. I, I was expecting him to take a little bit more ownership of that second unit alongside Jalen Williams. But he's blended in to a degree where, like, you know, we make the jokes about Terry Rozier setting off ball screens and stuff like that. Like, Gordon Hayward's doing that and then also just kind of moving it. And so I also just kind of want to see, like, where you were on Hayward. Not that it's pressed the red button time, but just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, let's see if I can recall, because I think all of this ends up tying together to your most recent thing, Gordon Hayward. I think it's just about fitting in. I think when you look at some of his possessions, the defensive things that he's tried to do as far as showing help and rotating – that's probably told me a lot more, especially when he had the quote where I can help us defensively. But OKC does have such a specific style of play and specific timing and specific reads that if you're, I think it's just kind of learning. Like there are moments where Gordon Hayward, they get to drive and kick. Hayward gets a catch in the corner and he drives the closeout instead of taking the shot, which, you know, fits in with what they want to do. But that pass goes to the next guy one pass ahead. I think there was one in Phoenix where he just drove and then just passed it right to Jalen Williams, and I didn't keep the advantage going. So it's just kind of finding those little gaps to where he can take his skill set and marry it with what OKC wants to do. So it's more not less of a concern and more of a just they need to have this time to work it out. But I think that's OKC yeah. in general. You talk about the wing room and the rotation. I think this is a team, and I'll probably get to it in a quote here, but this is a team that believes in their their people. They're going to try and make sure everyone has momentum and feels they can contribute and they're going to continue to develop and try and achieve the success they want to based on what they have going. I think that the the Josh Giddy portion ties in a little bit to the Shea portion that you talked about because of this reason. They work really hard to adjust to whatever a team throws at them. So we have the possessions where he's spaced uh, behind the three-point line. Then you also have the moments where he becomes a handoff person or a screener, and then you realize who's spaced around that, and they can flip it on you that way. You have the moments where Shea teams might start to crowd him in one way on his drives. So, hey, let's get you a screen. Let's get you an elbow catch. Let's do a stagger on this side to just create a little more sliver of a space so there everyone's occupied so you can have more room to operate one-on-one. Uh, obviously, going to stack, pick, and roll, but they're not afraid to put two guards in stack, pick, pick and roll action and, and basically just flip it on you to where we can attack a mismatch. Your, your, your defense is not set. So they're always kind of moving around the needle. Uh, the thing for me, and you know what? Let me real quick. I need people to understand the philosophy of the Oklahoma City Thunder and what they have built and how much of that is based on the belief and what they have built. Y'all, I've been trying to get people to understand at least that portion all year long. So you mentioned, hey, should I believe in the Oklahoma City Thunder? Yeah, you should believe in them because they believe in themselves. Obviously, in the playoffs, the playoffs are the playoffs. If a team figures out and hey, we're mixing coverages. We're stopping short on these closeouts. You guys aren't making the shots to make this pay. We figured out something on the other end to, to, to let us set up our defense and load up. It becomes a different story. But we know what OKC is. This is a team that's going to space the floor. They're going to open up driving lanes by clearing wings. They're going to balance the floor with their spacing. There's going to be cuts. They're going to drive the ball. They're going to continue to drive the ball. Every time you think you have them in a, in a box, they're going to continue to move it around offensively and now add the cutting and the kicks and the post-ups. They're going to work to adjust wherever you try and take away. Defensively, they're going to work to defend, rotate, and contest no matter what. I would like everyone to please, 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 please do not boil 
this Oklahoma City season down to LOL rebounds, though. <laughs> I beg of you. You, you, will, you will ruin, you will just take away the joy. It might end up being the bit, but you're going to lose so much of what they do well if that's all you're doing. Go back to that OKC Phoenix game. You remember when Mark Dadnall got interviewed at the end of the first quarter? Hmm. They asked him, <laughs> they asked, oh, that's a big number, huh? They asked him about Nurkic had 12 rebounds. Uh, 12, that's a big number, huh? Yeah, yeah we got to put a body on him, obviously. Is it a potential flaw or exploit? Sure. But you got to remember, all these good teams have a flaw. And we're getting to the time of year where you are working through those flaws, try and make them as strong as you can to try and pivot, to be ready for what's going to come. You're also trying to disguise them. The other team's job is to attack it and exploit it. That's, that's basketball. That's, that, that's what it's all about. I go back, and you mentioned the Mark Dadnall rebounding quote, right? Mm-hmm. I had a stronger one. I think it was Ryland Styles that posted it on March 1st from Mark Dadnall. A uh, direct quote. I'm going to read this because I typed it all out. You ready? Yeah. He said, we can't allow the relative success going into All-Star break to bite into our aggressiveness with understanding what we have with the team and also our aggressiveness to continue to develop the team and develop our players. The more aggressive you are, the more exploratory you are, the more you're going to introduce failure and the more you're going to introduce success. And we're willing to incur the setbacks to see what we can uncover with the team. That's the mentality. That's good stuff. That's what they're working with. That's what they want to be. That's who they are. Yes, we're good. Yes, we're going to attack, but we are going to play our style of play. We're going to make sure we move and have people ready and can adjust and rotate on the fly. But this is who we are. And I think that's the part that teams, no team has been able, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. How many teams have been able to put OKC in a box to where you genuinely feel like, ooh, they're not playing their style? It's a good question. I, I can't think of one. Like the teams have beat OKC. Teams have out, you know, teams have played better than OKC. I don't know how many teams have just taken them out of what they want to do. And I, I think there's value to that. I think there's value in them having an identity. Uh, the youth and experience, we will see if that pops up. It could go either way, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And that could have value for them. Uh, so I just think they're at the top for a reason. They've sustained for a reason. Just got to acknowledge it. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm excited about this team, man. Like, you know firsthand how <laughs> excited I've been about this Thunder group. Like, before the year, when we were on with JJ, and he asked, like, what do you think to see on this team? It's like, oh, they could, they could get home court. I did not foresee home court could just be the one seed. Like, it's pretty, it's incredible. Can I ask you a question before we talk about the one sure. seed? Do you do you want to briefly talk about their defense? Uh, because you said that, that you could put them as an instructional video, and I got mad for about five minutes. So I wanted, oh. I wanted to hear you out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. This is like the inverse of the other thing with the Thunder. Huh? That's crazy. But no, at that point, it was just like what they did to Phoenix in that second quarter. And it was like a continuation of, hey, Kevin Durant has the ball. Let's make sure he just doesn't have it anymore. And it's just double team after double team after double team after trap after double team. And the way that they were rotating behind that, like they were able to just get the flexions with how they were flying around. And then it also got to a point to where Phoenix was just anticipating they were getting ready to fly around. And now they're just tossing just inaccurate passes because they're trying to rush and get the ball ahead of their defense rotating. And it's just like, this is what it, this is what it looks like. This is what that kind of speed and aggression, like if you're going to be a a smaller group on average than the teams you're facing, you're going to have to win with aggression in some kind of way. It doesn't necessarily have to be like pick and roll blitzes or anything like that, but you're going to have to use that speed. You're going to have to close gaps very quickly and make teams work. And I feel like in the second quarter in particular, when they kind of blew that thing open, that's what that defense looked like. And so that was more, that was what that tweet was referencing. Like, this is, this is fun stuff from OKC. No, I, I understand it. I just want to poke at you real quick. I think the advantage that the Thunder have defensively is that most of their lineups have a level of size and length. And you mentioned the rotations. They're really strong at rotating, communicating, flowing into different closeouts, helping each other on that end when they do fully commit on a rotation. I also think the hidden part is it's very hard to manipulate and put a smaller defender as the low man on the weak side. 
So I think there's a consistency there throughout most of their lineups. Obviously, Joe and Wallace will play, but I think that's a that's a big plus for them. The interesting part for me is defensively, how much do you want to fly around in the playoffs? Mm-hmm. And can whatever you show defensively be used against you in a series? To where once you show your hand, you know, it's a little different than the regular season. Once you show your hand, we know this is coming. Now we're going to scheme against that. Now, the positive, they have a lot of things they throw out in their back pocket. But have you seen the current West play-in? <laughs> it's the uh, the dream play-in for Mr. Silver, I would imagine. Phoenix, Dallas, Golden State, the Lakers. So you mean to tell me two of these teams that have had incredible regular seasons are about to get handed one, uh, two of those four? Yeah, I'd be kind of heated. Like, That's, excited as a competitor, but, like, I'd be kind of heated. Like, I did all this, and my reward is Luka Doncic. And or Kevin Durant, and Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal, and or Stephen Curry, and or LeBron James, and Anthony Davis. <laughs> First round. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, you kidding me? <laughs> That's 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 the dynamic that I'm keeping an eye on. Not to be unfair to the teams that have surged to the top, but mostly that's not an easy thing to sign up for. Um, actually, how do you feel about these teams in the playing? Because I kind of had some questions. I've been thinking about these teams. No, I was just gonna say very quickly. Like we've just been doing this podcast for a long time because, like, literally, a question that I had for you was, "Hey, how how much do you think OKC's trans defense will translate in the postseason because of how aggressive they are and stuff?" And so, like, the fact that you just float right into that, it's like, huh. <laughs> this is this is why we do the thing, huh? But uh, on the play in portion, where, where do you want to start? Overall, uh, it's it's it was a, a little bit of a rough weekend for all four of the teams currently in the play in. Uh, mm-hmm. Phoenix uh, unfortunately lost Devin Booker, lost to Houston, lost to OKC. Dallas ended up losing to the Embiidless Sixers. Gold State that happened in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and the Lakers lost to the Nuggets again. And so my th- my question, my theme is, who do you trust within these teams? And do you trust any of these defenses? Because I'm, I'm thinking about it, I'm looking at it. I think the Lakers have a lot of size. They have a lot of length. They have Anthony Davis. The issue is how much do they need, how high of a level do they need their defense to be at for them to be the best version of themselves? Gold State has levels they can hit. I don't know how often they've hit those levels. And because of the lineup switching and changing, can you consistently hit that side of the ball with some of these lineups that help you out offensively? With Dallas, I think there's been a lot of positive things with P.J. Washington and his versatility and being able to guard multiple positions. Having Lively and Gaffer be able to show a level of rim protection is fantastic. There's a dynamic there where... What happens when you go small? How often do you want to go small? How much scheme versatility do you feel like you have with Gafford and Lively? They've been mixing in more switches with Lively. Do you feel comfortable enough with those switches to be able to just extend those minutes? Or Mm -hmm. are you going to go small? And if you go small, are you going to lock in on the switches? Because now if you're committing to going small and your switching isn't great, what have we accomplished? And now if you're ending up having to send doubles to Tobias Harris because of switches, or you're going to switch and double against Tyrese Maxey because they put Luka and anyone named anyone on that court in action. Can you rotate behind that? Can you sustain defense? That's a concern for me. That's a concern for me with with Phoenix, right? I think Royce O'Neal has helped a lot. I think he's taken on some good matchups. I think that allows KD to roam when he's able to roam on the weak side. That's a major plus. I think Nurk's worked hard. We got bowl, bowl, giving effort. Uh, they're mixing in zone possessions. They have small lineups we've seen where they can switch everything, keep it in front. Do you trust it? Was that rhetorical? Were you about to go to the next team? Or no, that actually was it. There? Do, oh, do okay. you trust it? You. Man, this is very much like the OKC game just being in my head with Phoenix. But it's just like, on one hand, yeah, because like they're really starting to figure some stuff out defensively without Nurkic on the floor, and I think that's a really that's a really big positive. Like the KD and Bowl minutes have been a lot of fun for me for obvious reasons, but they have legitimately been effective. 
And then I look at the OKC game, and when they go KD plus bench, it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm feeling better about this unit. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, let's double KD. And it's just like, oh, they do not care about Royce O'Neal out there, huh? Oh, hey, we got some random David Roddy. They do not care about him out there, huh? And then my mind just goes to the playoff mode. It's like, oh, snap. What exactly is this lineup versatility going to look like? Because in theory, yeah, we can play our starters. We can flow with different, like, star-led bench units, et cetera. Are our guys easy to hit, like, within doubles? Like, are, they, are our guys easier to hit because we have too many help points? And it kind of goes back to how many two-way players do we have on the roster? Like, when I brought up Phoenix last week, it was more so within the lens of, you know, the line of versatility, but, like, the line of versatility in relation to, like, the size that they have. And it's like, okay, they go KD at the five, but it's KD and, like, four, six, three dudes. What does that really mean? And can teams hit that? But now going beyond that, it's like, okay, if we do add a little bit more defense to take some pressure off of KD, et cetera, get some stops, get out in transition, cool. If we get in the half court and teams are just deciding we're just going to double KD all the time, how many of these guys are comfortable help points? How many of these guys are comfortable end points for the possession for a defense? And that's kind of something similar that I brought up on the pod last week. But like, can they find that balance to where they can defend they can get, they can knock down shots, and they also have the size to where they're just not getting beat up on the interior. I don't know. So, like to answer your question, I don't know how much I trust it. But I see good things, but I also see very obvious counters <laughs> in the postseason, depending on who they face. And like Phoenix could very well end up with OKC in round one, <laughs> based on how things are set up right now. And if you know, if yesterday was any indication, which you give Phoenix some bells, second night of back to back, no Devin Booker, so like obviously that part matters. Is the end all be all, but it's like it's at least a data point in my mind and something that I think about. Like, okay, can they find the right balance with some of these lineups? I think the issue for Phoenix is more so the timing and the injuries. And where I think we've both seen a lot of good things that would help them in a playoff context, but you haven't been able to put the entire puzzle pieces together. I think the difficult nature for me is you see the type of shots they can generate when they create an advantage, whether it's two on the ball and pick and roll or double team, you see the pressure they put on teams. You see the shots that open up. You also see what happens when they don't create an advantage or it goes to the person the defense wants. And so from a like analysis standpoint, those are almost polar opposites. And I think it's easy to say in the playoffs, they'll probably have different lineups and they will. And while there are some obvious counters, we can go drop, we can live a switch. That's still handing things to Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, and Devin Booker. Which yeah, I understand the record. It's not, a, it doesn't take a lot of shot making to make that an uncomfortable scenario. And so I think it's just, okay, what is the true rotation going to be, you know, is the best idea to kind of, you know, take Beal out first, let KD and Booker play, and then you let Booker play with the bench. And you come back with KD and Beal, and then, it's more for me, How what are they running outside of pick and roll? And how can you initiate offense other ways? Or just find a way to keep advantages when you do get those double teams. I think that's where my head goes to. And you, you, mean, you need reps to work that out, but at the same time, you're running out of time to kind of really put your foot down. And with Booker being out, it's just not ideal. Understood. And then just kind of cycling through the rest of the plan real quick, like on the Dallas defense portion of the program, like I continue to keep eyes on just what the big man room is going to look like and how much faith uh, Jason Fish, uh, Jason Kidd is going to have in allowing him to do different things scheme wise. I'm also just kind of keeping eyes on like you brought up like Kyrie and Luca on the weak side and making either of those guys make decisions or putting them in action, like watching their two most recent games and like watching the Boston game and stuff. I'm looking at these in Philly. Like I'm watching the switch and doubles, particularly when Luca was involved. And I'm just like, Oh no, I don't like any of what I'm seeing right now. And they are having fun just poking holes at like the recovery speed of Luca, the recovery distance that he may have some of the pointing as he's recovering, like, Hey, you drop down to get this guy. Like there was a missed three on the left wing from Kelly Oubre. But it was after pick and roll, they went switch and double. And 
Luke was just going to the free throw line. He's just pointing. I think it was I think it was Nick Batum that like screened for him to slip down to the free throw line. And I'm just like, huh. Luke is doing the point thing instead of like I understand why because he wants to go out to the wing. He wants someone to pick up someone roaming in the dunker spot, et cetera. And it's just like, wait a minute, y'all gotta y'all gotta tighten this up. And it's like watching the Boston game. Hey man, it's Boston who, as we said at the top, like they've just been the most dominant team in basketball for this season period, but like especially over the last eleven games. And so it's Boston, and not everyone can bend you like Boston can. But I'm also just thinking, like, process-wise, hey, man, I don't want things to go the wrong way with Luka defensively. Because generally, he has given better effort. And, like, I made the joke a couple of years ago when they had the top 10 defense. I was like, hey, are they low-key just doing the James Harden thing to where we just want to keep Luka as the low man? We keep you here. It's just like a one-man zone. The people pass through. It's just an automatic switch so he doesn't have to move. It feels like they're doing some of that, but, like, teams are starting to poke at that a little bit more. Or at the very least, it's starting to pop for me more as I watch Dallas. And so I'm just kind of monitoring, hey, man, if you have questions about the bigs and then you can also put Kyrie in action and then you can also put Luka in action and you now have like Josh Green, bless his heart, like he's starting to botch some of these switches. Hey, the defense can't go backwards because then we're just back at square one with they can score with anyone but also. Can I raise my hand real, real quick? Sure. I'm just trying to double check some data real quick. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Was it last week you talked about the the Dallas defense, or was it two weeks ago? No, <laughs> <laughs> it was very recent. It's like, hey, gave, gave the love to PJ Washington. Things look better again. Like I'm just looking at this. We're just going with the, the uh, last two games. It's like, hey, this is what the other side can look like. I'm not about to do a full 180 like that. I'm just saying, hey. When it's good, it can be this, and you can see the pathway to Dallas making a legitimate run, even though they're in playing right now. If it's what has been the last couple of games, that's where I get hesitant. And like that's where like the questions about the defense kind of spark for me to begin with. There's like this was an example of the question that I had coming in. Man, you'll be listening to me, man. I told you Indiana said, hey, Luca, Kyrie, what lively. Y'all all be on the weak side. We're about to just drive and kick to your man. I literally referenced that in my thing. What you mean? <laughs> I think the, the biggest thing, though, is Boston. I think Boston made Dallas work. And Dallas wasn't. They were in between some of the switching they wanted to do and some of the switching they didn't want to do. But they consistently had people to make them pay when they switched. The Philly thing was a little different, a little odd, a little unexpected. I think for me, when you go to the switch and double, I thought the rotations were fine, ultimately. They didn't get some of the rebounds they needed to. I felt like they had to send some of the attention places they didn't necessarily want to. I think the issue is also just containing penetration and sustaining defense. They had some pretty good reps. It's just, okay, are are we switching? Are we switching everything? Are we switching doubling? I felt like there was a little messiness at times with the consistency of their scheme. And when you're a, when you're a team of a certain defensive caliber, you can't afford those kind of breakdowns, especially in today's mm-hmm. NBA, to where, hey, I think I'm switching. Oh, wait, I think I'm helping. Oh, no. Like, there was one where, hey, Derrick Jones Jr. just stunts. It looks like it's a switch. An open lane comes. Luke is like, oh, no, I need to help you. P.J. Washington's like, oh, no, I need to help you. Kyrie stunted at where <laughs> P.J. Washington was, and it was an open three. And it's like, hey. How is this the bit? So, <laughs> you know, if you're going to be a switch team, a small team, you got to be able to nail those details uh, to really be able to have that defense that can do a little bit of everything. But, you know, I balance that out with, hey, some of these lively switches look pretty good. They do. He's, he's just good. Man. So that's, that's a plus for you. Do you trust it? Do you trust the rotations behind it? If you get a Porzingis or a Tobias posting up, what's your next step? So it's kind of just building on top of that. Uh, um, I'm keeping an eye on it. I'm keeping an eye on it, indeed. Um, where are you on the? If we could do your your monthly obligation obligatory Laker talk, like where are you at with the Lakers right now? I, I think the I'm not in a bad place with the Lakers, especially if we're going to get this version of LeBron, because I think they're closer to the formula than we've seen all all season. This stretch has been, we know what our identity could be. We have size and length on one end. Anthony Davis playing at a certain level. 
Austin Reeves and D'Angelo feel more comfortable. Rui's doing a little bit of everything offensively. Uh, and then if we can control the tempo, we get to the fourth, we get to a close game, we can find ways to win. LeBron put pressure on you in different ways. And he's done so. I think the issue for me is, okay, what's the positioning going to be for you if you're the Lakers? You're a game and a half out of eight. So how how, how far are you going to go with it? Mm-hmm. And ultimately, do you have enough confidence in playing your best five players together down the stretch? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not – it's not like I'm saying the Lakers are bad. I think they're very good. They're really tough to deal with, especially – in the in the crypto, mm-hmm. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to feel a certain way about them. Honestly, yeah, I understood. Like, I think probably the biggest question I have for the Lakers as of late, as I kind of hone in on what they've been able to do, and at least solidify themselves as a play in team. Because, like, you look at eleven through fifteen, like that just seems done. We we have the team. We have the ten. We're just now trying to figure out what the order is going to be at this point. Um, I'm kind of looking at the Laker defense, and it feels weird to ask like how much scheme versatility does Anthony Davis have? Because like in terms of his own talent, he can do literally anything you ask him to do defensively. So it's not a question of him. It's more so like how much is he allowed to do based on who he has in front of him, and like more so eyeing like the D'Lo Austin Reeves portion of the program. Like, how many things can the Lakers throw at them? Uh, how many things can the Lakers throw at defense, uh, offenses, rather, in light of that? Because I think that was part of why Darvin Ham was searching a little bit in the Denver game in particular. Like, okay, who do we want to have guard Jamal Murray? Because we're already trying to decide, do we want to put AD on Jokic? Do we want to put him on insert wing here so he can roam around? You give, like, Rui to Jokic assignment and stuff like that. Can you do that and then also throw different coverages out in ball screens if Jamal Murray's involved? And you end up with Cam Reddish, and then you look on the other end, and it's Jamal Murray chilling in the corner because you don't want Cam Reddish to do things with the ball, and he also isn't a threatening shooter. And that all kind of ties in together. So, like, I'm trying to see, like, how – if that makes sense. Well, I would say, is there another team that can put the kind of pressure that Denver can put on them? I, I don't think so. So, like, that may just be a Denver problem if they see him in round one. That's the problem. They could see them in round one. Yeah, that's <laughs> well here. Let me let me lob a free throw for you then. Okay. Do you feel bad about the Lakers defensively against Denver or OKC? Um hmm. that's a darn good question. <laughs> um I guess it's OKC by default. Like I don't really feel great about them against OKC. I, you want you want a, a semi hot take? What you got? I thought the Lakers got enough of the uh, help, short close mix of things to make things interesting. It's OKC. Hmm. Like, I, like, I don't think that's an unreasonable take. Yeah, you're going to have to make some shots, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, yeah, I was about to say, you just flip it to the other end. And like, again, Phoenix game very much just burned in my head right now since it just happened yesterday. But OKC has shown a willingness that, hey, if you got help points on the floor, if we worried about anybody else, we'll send two. We'll scramble. We will dare you to hit these shots. And I, I, honestly, I feel like the Lakers, oh, my God, you're in rotation against us? <laughs> Finally. <laughs> that's what we've been waiting for. <laughs> so that, that's stuck in my brain. Uh, can I talk about the other team? Sure. Out West? What you got? The Minnesota Timberwolves. Ooh. Uh, Fun game am- against the Clippers on Sunday. Fun game against Clippers. Real hoop is back. I'm I'm in a fun place with them because I think they're good. They're very good. They have a playoff ceiling. They have an identity. They have a formula. Offensively, some of the questions remain the same. There's more potential answers, though. I do think Minnesota has taken some really good steps offensively. I think Anthony Edwards and his playmaking and skip passes have been really good. I think the off-ball movement, when they are humming and they're cutting and they're moving the ball, it's going side to side, that's been a plus. I think Rudy's roles have been strong. Some of his seals have been good. Kyle Anderson, like being a big out there next to Cat and Nas Reed and being a hub has been really fun as those two fly off screens and Kyle Anderson just kind of operates with handoffs. I think Cat's done a really great job of finding gaps and making wings pay. Uh, and when he's spaced, being able to 
be smarter uh, with his cuts and with his shots and be aggressive with his drives. The playoff question, again, is how do they handle switches? And the more I think about it, it feels like it's less a shot at the certain personnel and more we think you're just going to take the bait. We're going to get in the mud and we like our chances if you play that way. Mm -hmm. And can they find that balance between taking these reps to, hey, punish some of these mismatches and, and try and get teams out of switching versus playing the way they play and having some of the movement, having some of the slips and the cuts. And they kind of alternate between that sometimes. And I think the thing for me with Cat is it's advanced past just purely switching against Carl Anthony Towns. I think that's a credit to what he's done this year. I think it's different, though, when a team pushes his catches out above the three-point line like the Clippers did. And now those drives that we've seen get a little bit closer to the turbo button drives where, hey, I got to rev this up, one, two, three dribbles. I'm just now getting to the paint, and the help is watching and, and loaded up. Mm-hmm. Minnesota usually counters with Cat getting some of those lower catches under, you know, inside the three-point line at the elbow. That's more positive. I can jab. I can initiate contact. These two dribbles, I'm in the paint. I can, you know, play off of doubles. You can lead the dance a little bit more. We've seen positive things out of that, especially some of the playmaking when, when teams mm-hmm. show help when he's down there. I also wonder if some teams are just like, hey, just keep throwing it to Cat. Or throw the cat in the post. Like, can we get y'all to just settle for just, just doing that? And now we cat. don't have to deal with some of these other things. That sounds like an insult, but it's not. Because I'm just thinking philosophically, hey, you guys have versatility. You guys have a lot of people who can make different plays, especially in what you want to do offensively. If we just boil it down to Ant and Cat, do we win something there? What do you think? I can... I can see the argument there. And like with some of the concerns that we've had, like you noted the playmaking growth with Ant. But again, that's not an elite part of his game, at least not yet. And so like, can you get into some of the decision-making ordeal with Cat? Like I think he's been, in terms of just pure skill, like I don't think there's a pass that can't that Cat can't make. If it does become a whole lot of late clock Cat, can you send some timely help and force him into one of those hook passes that go to, you know, guy in the corner hits him in the, you got to reach down, defense can recover, now you're late in the clock, you got to do something. Like, can you force him into some of those? And now you just get timely stops, even with Cat playing well right now. Like, can you do it? So, like, I can see the I can see the pathway there to where we just, let's just funnel it to you and let's make you win this game for, for Minnesota. See what happens here. Can I give you a quick Anthony Edwards stat? Yes. As you mentioned, the passing portion, I'm going to pull it up really quick. Skip passes to the corner for Anthony Edwards in his career. Uh, 23 in the rookie year, 23 the year after. He had 81 last year. He already has thrown 76, and we have uh, quite a few games left. So, like, that's just a quick glimpse into the passing growth for Anthony Edwards. He's at least seeing that pass more and hitting it in a more timely fashion, so I wanted to sprinkle that one in there for you. I like that stat. It's a good stat. There we go. That's all the, uh, all the validation I needed there. Oh. Um, <laughs> did you have another Wolves <laughs> offense that thought? Because I had a defense one. I think for me, it's just very quickly, like where Cat is catching the basketball. Like you already hit that point, so I'm not going to hang there too long. But like, I think that's going to be important. Um, And then it's just going to be like three-point willingness from the actual point guards on the roster. We know Mike Conley can shoot the leather off of it. Does he want to take seven, eight, nine, ten in a game? He may have to in the playoffs. Like, is he willing to do that? Skill-wise, no question about it. But will he do that? And with Monty Morris, a guy that can knock down spot-up shots, He's comfortable pulling against the switch, or at least he can do that against a switch or an under. Will he be willing to take five, six, maybe seven in a playoff game? That's yet to be seen. And if defenses feel like, well, he's not going to take those, does that further shrink the floor for Minnesota offensively? Do you start to lose some of the, like, the and on the bench minutes? And, like, do you lose that margin for error offensively? Like, those are some things, some thoughts that I have. And then just keeping an eye on Jaden McDaniels, just as a concept offensively. How strong slash decisive are the drives? When he catches it in the corner, will he take the shot when he catches the ball in the corner when he's open? Or will there be a slight hesitation because he can't, and okay, in Minnesota overall can't afford for him to sit on some of those? Love Jaden McDaniels, but, you know, those are the things. I, I think with McDaniels, he's shown enough with the drives to where I'm not concerned. It does feel a little bit of pull up or bust sometimes, but... Um, I'm still confident. 
Can I ask another Wolves question? Sure. So I feel like a lot of the times we focus on, hey, Wolves against small lineups. Can you play Rudy off the floor? I think Rudy's been really good in space this year, especially some of the switches he's had to do, uh, especially some in that Clippers game where, hey, Paul George, I'm going to keep you in front. Is the real bit, Nikaias, to make a lineup where Carl Anthony Towns absolutely has to guard someone? Mm. Could be. Could be. Like That's the other side of Cats the Four now. Because, like, generally, like, you're going 1-4 pick and roll versus 1-5. Like, that's where you're more likely to see the switch or... You know, like in the case of Atlanta, for example, since they're just always top of mind for me, like if it's Trey and Jalen Johnson, you're likely you're just getting two on the ball. Or if Trey's involved, you're getting two on the ball. And so like that may be the point where Cat has to guard or, okay, we're guaranteed to get two on the ball here. And so like this may be a built-in way to get this super elite defense in rotation and we can, you know, we can do our best from there. So it's, it's worth noting what, what Cat does in these situations. And I feel like he's been good this year especially relative to like what he's been in the past defensively. I think this has been a good season for him. But again, you go into the playoff context and what that may look like. It's a fair question to ask. I like it. Did you uh, have any other teams making you think, or do you want to shout out some players? Um, I think we can get to the player shout out portion. Yeah, we, we shout out some players really quick. So one, uh, for one, I want to raise my hand quickly apologize because I meant to note on the Thursday pod um, that the Athletes Unlimited season was starting up that weekend and didn't do so. And so we did get the opening week of play. And then you know, as we record on the Monday, the episode is going to drop on a Tuesday. Um, they did redraft for week two of AU, so different teams and stuff. So I just wanted to quickly shout out Alicia Gray, uh, first time playing in the AU circuit. She, uh, I want to I want to word this correctly. Cause like it, it sounds weird to be like she shouldn't be there because like the league is good and I love seeing that W players and other players have like a state side option during the offseason to do that. So like I'm very glad that she's playing in AU and giving it more visibility and just has the opportunity in general. On the other hand, she averaged 29, 5, and 6 with three steals in the opening week, and nobody could draw nobody could defend her off the bounce. She's pulling up for three. She's getting off-screen stuff. She's flying around defensively. Like, she was just very clearly the best player there. And so, like, within that sense, and, like, I'm mostly joking, like, she shouldn't be there. But, like, within that sense, she was just the best player on the court. And it looked like it. She also drafted the best team, which I don't understand how Alicia Gray was allowed to draft Natasha Cloud and also get Tiffany Mitchell and also get... <laughs> I'm just like, dog... Y'all let her draft the super team is crazy. But a uh, quick shout out to Alicia Gray and what she was able to put together in week one. Um, some other players to shout out. Uh, Maddie Segrist of the Dallas Wings. She averaged 16 and 10. Um, shot well from three. Also had some fun drives. Uh, going back to like the the opening game where she was matched up against Kalani Brown. You can imagine that stylistic clash. Kalani just posting up folks and getting offensive rebounds. And here's Maddie Segrist just above the break. Can operate as a handoff hub. Can drive from above the break and get downhill as well. And so, like, that was fun, but I, uh, Maddie, Maddie Seegers averaged 16 and 10 um, in week one. Odyssey Sims, woo, the drives, the drives, the drives, the drives. Average 23 and 11. She had 31 free throw attempts in three games. Could not keep her out of the paint. Um, quick hat tip to Air Hearns defense. On Aces watch, Kirsten Bell, the cutting, also shot well from three in week one, so we'll see how week two goes. Um, so I wanted to give a quick AU hat tip. So if you want to tap in with Athletes Unlimited, um, those games are streaming on the WNBA app, uh, ESPN Plus. I think Valley Sports is, ho- is hosting some of those games as well. So check those out um, if you are trying to keep up with at least some W during the offseason right now. Um, beyond that, Cade Cunningham, averaging 24 points and 7 assists post-All-Star break, enjoying the drives, enjoying the shooting. From Cade Cunningham. Like, that's making me happy. Like, I love that he's getting a little bit more usage off the ball. The pull ups are going in at a higher degree. And so I'm just continuing to track. Like, Detroit, I have separate thoughts about Detroit as a concept, but I am enjoying the Cade Cunningham experience. We'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, Jalen Suggs, averaging 12 points, four assists, still in half and nearly a block post All Star break. Really enjoying everything that he's doing off the ball right now. Defensively, I think that speaks for himself. The man flies around all over the place, really good screen navigator. When he is just purely off ball, he can fly in, fly in with steals, get deflections, 
If he's tagging and getting back out there, the closeouts are fun. If he's challenging shots at the rim, he's one of the better guards in the league at doing so. Offensively, it helps that he's knocking down threes. That's cool. Shooting 48% from three post All-Star break. But watching this dude just hammers, flares, pin-ins, just clipping folks as he's like relocating to different places on the floor. Just watch Jalen Suggs on a position that he doesn't have the ball in his hands on. You will have fun or at least gain a greater appreciation for all the little things that he does. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., averaging 22-9, and nine, shooting 43% from three post-All-Star break so far. But more than anything, I've kind of enjoyed the defense from him more than anything. Like, he's continued to progress on that end. Um, when he is the low man defensively, with Denver being a little bit more aggressive in pick and roll, like, he's in the right spot even more consistently. I love that he's continued to take those steps, challenging things. So I wanted to give him the quick hat tip there. Yusuf Nurkic, it's brought up a little bit earlier in the pod. 31 boards against OKC is insane. So, like, let's just, we'll just toss that one in there first. But beyond that, Phoenix's defense has been pretty darn solid with Nurk on the floor this year. And, like, that may say a little bit more about, like, what the small ball units on the whole of the season have been like. But, like, he has been important for what they've been able to do. Like, he's unlocked KD as a weak side guy. Him being able to take on those matchups allows KD to roam around and give, you know, have that kind of impact that he's had this year. So I did want to give the hat tip to Nurk. He has been working. Like, I have had questions about Yusuf Nurkic defensively for quite a bit. So, like, I, you know, I'll raise my hand there. But props where props are due. Like, I do think he is doing his best within the scheme and unlocking some other guys for Phoenix. I just wanted to give him the hat tip there. And the uh, last guy I wanted to bring up, Marvin Bagley in Washington. A 14-9 post-All-Star break. This is very much a I see you working big dog salute for Marvin Bagley. Washington trying to limit some of the rim attempts. They have him in a deeper drop. <laughs> Steve took off the hammer. <laughs> uh, I will watch Wizards games so some of y'all don't have to. But no, they've had him in a deeper drop. And I, I've been impressed with some of the decision-making within the drop. Some of the footwork looking a little bit cleaner, challenging stuff at the rim. Like it, I'm not going to call him a stopper. Like I'm not making that case. But it has been better than what you would expect from Marvin Bagley defensively. So I want to give him a quick hat tip. Um, Pre-All-Star break, the Wizards were 23rd in opponent rim rate. Post-All-Star break, they're 14th. Small sample, naturally. But that is about a two percentage points drop in terms of the opponent rim rate. And so you can kind of see that there. Um, team, opponents taking more mid-range shots. Also taking more threes. So like, that's the thing. But they've been a low three-point rate team all year long. So even that hasn't really hit them to that degree. But also, going to NBA.com's uh, tracking data, when Marvin Bagley is challenging a shot at the rim, opponent shooting 58.8% from the field post-All-Star break. That is 14th of 37 players defending at least five shots a game. And to put that number in perspective, uh, in that same time frame, Bam's at 58.6, so slightly ahead of Bagley. Um, Bagley also ahead of Anthony Davis in that number, Nick Claxton in that number, Walker Kessler in that number, Jared Allen in that number, just to name a few. So, again, I just want to salute the, the good stretch, or at least the good process and the improvement from Marvin Bagley on that end. It's not all great in Washington, but a bright spot if you want to you give him that. So, there you go. Are you okay? Yeah. Did you watch the Kelsey press conference during the pod or something? Are you good? <laughs> you, within an hour, you have complimented Kevin Love, Yusuf Nurkic, and Marvin Bagley. Are you okay? I, I am fine. Yeah. Okay. Hat tip. Salute. You know? Yeah. Hat tip. Salute. Uh, I'll add to Michael Porter Jr., uh, the Denver Nuggets are nine and three when he has a double double uh, this year. Twelve and three over the past two years when he has a double double. Just want to shout that out. Uh, Trey Murphy, real quick, twenty or more in two of his last three games. Pelicans are five and zero when he scores twenty or more this year. Uh, over the last two seasons, seventeen and four when he scores twenty or more. Hmm. Uh, I believe. Uh, Jalen Green had back-to-back 34-point perform- point performances in Phoenix. And hey, look, he can still score and make shots. It's amazing uh, what he looks like when they play with a little bit more tempo. And he also plays like the plays he can make when he's not immediately seeking contact from his defender who's fighting over the screen. <laughs> it's just it's insane how that works. Um, so are you saying that it's it's not always a good thing to try to put your defender in jail regardless of what's happening in front of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's gotta gotta gotta, gotta get that out of here. Uh wanted to add to your quick hat tip to Shea. 45th 30 point game in 59 games played. Only two players in NBA history have reached that mark faster. 
Wilt Chamberlain and Michael Jordan. So uh, salute to Shea. And Josh Hart. Yeah. Uh, he has played 40 or more minutes in six straight games. <laughs> That's so absurd, man. He has three straight. Also, <laughs> I was going to say very quickly before you get into the Hart thing. Like, I, I took a Sunday nap, so I didn't catch the, uh, the Knicks Cavs games live. And I woke up to people freaking out about Jalen Brunson, or I just saw a bunch of messages like, I hope he's okay. I was like, wait a minute, what the heck happened? And I look at the box score, and Josh Hart had that's that line. I was like, wait a minute, what the heck happened? It is, it's not funny that Jalen Brunson got hurt. I, I hope he's okay, and I hope it isn't like a really serious injury, because duh, nobody wants to see that. But like, I did chuckle when I saw that he only played 47 seconds, and Miles McBride played literally the rest of the basketball game. And then also saw Alec Burks play like 11 minutes. I was like, so there was just no room, huh, for, for old Deuce to get a breather. That's, uh, huh. I just got to chuckle out of that one. But continue. Uh, I was going to say, uh, at least three straight games of, of at least a double-double. Uh, 13 points, 19 rebounds, 10 assists against Cleveland. Uh, in the six games post-All-Star break, uh, Josh Hart averaging 16.5 points per game. 12.5 rebounds, 6.2 assists, 1.3 steals, 42.9% from the field, 41.2% from three on 5.7 attempts. I, I say that only to say pre-All-Star break, Josh Hart was shooting 30.6% from three on three attempts, an average seven and seven. So I ask you this question. Uh, is okay. Josh Hart the first potential candidate for most improved player based on same season play? <laughs> That's such a, no, no, he is not. Oh, absolutely not. Okay, so okay. All due respect. So, so Hall- hashtag chain check. So Halliburton, yeah. it is. All right. Uh, okay. Also, it's some, it's some quick news that uh, Nikias was unaware of. Uh, Los Angeles Lakers forward LeBron James and Boston Celtics forward Jalen Brown have been named the NBA Western and Eastern Conference Players of the Week, respectfully, for Week 19 of the 2023-24 season. Okay, well, first, thank you, Steve, for uh, thank you, Steve, for dropping that one because I would have missed that one. Also, a very quick salute to LeBron James for eclipsing forty thousand career points. The uh, the forty k, ten k, ten k club is LeBron James, and like you know his shoe collection and whatever other collectibles he wants to bring into the room with him because it's only him. What a talent! What a talent! Like this is one of the best careers in sports history that we are witnessing in real time and when he has these games like he had against the Clippers earlier in the week like it's just <sighs> don't don't take that dude for granted man like that doesn't mean you can't get your jokes off doesn't mean you can't have like basketball debates like you know we don't need to get into like the gatekeeping bag but like really recognize what this dude is doing and what he's meant for the sport for two decades like it's insane no, nah, don't don't take it for granted. Uh, LeBron has been insane to, to be able to be doing this uh, in year twenty one to where legit twenty one twenty five seven and seven. And if he was making free throws, it'd be fifty forty ninety. <laughs> but just think about that. That's insane. Also, the man's making chase down blocks on the second night of a back to back and hitting threes to tie the game, while also Nikias fixing the net in between. <laughs> man got a chase down block against Washington and then oh yeah let me fix this real quick get a stop hit a three it's insane uh, can I ask you a quick free throw before you hit the horns uh, yes because I also have a, uh, a question afterwards that's fine uh, Damian Lillard revealed to Patrick Beverly that he can play defense when he wants when he has to but he's been in situations where he hasn't had to uh, what do you make of that I don't know if I have enough time to get into it. I ain't going to hold Perfect. you. Perfect. I'll pivot then. Uh, <laughs> what, what makes you uh, feel stronger about the Nuggets uh, championship uh, dreams? Uh, Coach Michael Malone has not hit 9 out of 10 on the anger meter. Uh, Nikola Jokic rallied everyone with a group text. Or Justin Holiday uh, said the way they're playing after All-Star break kind of makes him believe in the NBA again, if that makes sense. Wow. That's a... <laughs> Hey, how much of that is just appreciation for Justin Holiday? Because that man's been on some teams, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Is he just <laughs> thinking he's just happy to be there? Yeah. Um, I guess to answer your question, it's like Jokic sending out the group text. I think that's just deep. Okay. Okay, so my, my last question, and I'll hit the horns, do the outro, all that good stuff. And so, like, I'm not 100% sure on how the NBA classifies its weeks. But I just did, like, a cursory search of, like, you know, player stats from February 26th. <laughs> and uh, you said it was LeBron and Jalen Brown, right? Yeah. Okay, all due respect. Um... Like, I understand the concept of, like, it has to be a Celtic. And, like, also LeBron, wild comeback, beat the Wizards, played well against the Nuggets and the Laws. Cool. Like, I understand that. Did LeBron really have a better week than Shea? Uh, did did Jalen Brown really have a better week than Giannis? Like, I, I would be one of, like, six people to actually question player of the week. Like, it's it's a life or death thing or whatever. But, like, are we sure... All respect, you know, all respect due. But, like, are we... I, I just want you to know I really appreciate the dynamic of you saying we have to appreciate LeBron James <laughs> and then literally <laughs> immediately questioning why he won Player of the Week. That is just... <laughs> peak. Peak entertainment. We can appreciate great play while also acknowledging someone might have played better this week. Peak. I'm going to save you from yourself and just quickly mention that Victor Wembanyama. And uh, Charlotte Hornets forward Brandon Miller uh, were named the Kia NBA Western and Eastern Conference Rookies of the Month for games played oh, in right. February. So there you go. Hit the that's horns. Right. This man. Shout out Wimby. Uh, rookie of the year. Uh, Brandon Miller, first team all rookie. There we go. Thank you for listening to and or watching this episode of The Dunker Spot. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us. We are on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Podbean. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you are watching this on JJ Reddit's YouTube channel, and for some reason you aren't subscribed to JJ Reddit's YouTube channel, you should probably subscribe to JJ Reddit's YouTube channel. We are here every Tuesday. That is the day after Monday, the day before Wednesday. But throughout the week, there's just a ton of great content being sprinkled on the channel. So come check it out. Have some fun. Grow your love of basketball with us. You can follow me on Twitter at Nikaias NBA. You can follow Steve on Twitter at Steve Jones20. Join the Dunker Spot community on Twitter if you haven't already. And if you have a League Pass subscription, watch basketball with us with via Watch Playback. Join us for our online Dunker Spot watch parties. The link is in the description. You're getting real-time analysis from us. During commercial breaks, we're breaking down plays. If we get any fourth quarter or overtime shenanigans, we got Steve breaking down why stuff that did or didn't work. So if you want to get deeper into the basketball bag, you can do that. Also, we do let the hair down a bit. You get more of the jokes. It's not just basketball talk. So you can have a good time with us. And if you want to get a little bit more serious, you want to vent about life or your job or whatever happened in there, like we'll let people get up on stage, talk to us, ask us questions, whatever the case may be. So it is a safe space for you if you just want to chill. Steve's just like, nah, no, it ain't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, disregard. Uh, join us anyway, though. Uh, the <laughs> link to the room should be hyperlinked. It is free to make your profile. Again, if you have a lead pass subscription, you should be good to go. But click on the link, enter your information. It's free, no shenanigans. Um, if it's not hyperlinked for whatever reason with the app that you're using podcast-wise, just copy it. It's going to be in the description either way. Copy that into your browser. Once again, it is free. No shenanigans. Come rock with us. And with that, we will catch y'all later in the week. Hey, Nikaias, great job, man. Are you sure you're good? That's a lot of bigs you talked about. <laughs>